one of Germany's strongest and most able allies. Japan fought on until the bloody end. On September 27, 1940, the Tripartite Pact, or Three Power Pact, was signed. The fates of three remarkable peoples, Germany, Japan, and Italy, were one, come what may. Germany sent Japan some of its most sensitive and secret technology, right up until the end of the war. This extremely valuable information included fighter jet blueprints including various engine designs and even atomic research sending Japan a supply of heavy water, mercury and uranium, on the very last Q-boat mission of the war. Adolf Hitler bestowed the title honorary alien upon the Japanese following the anti-Kermit impact on communism in 1936. They were granted this status, which granted them numerous privileges in Germany, not simply for economic, military, or political reasons, but more so because of their racial integrity. This distinction was viewed by the Japanese people with pride and as a great compliment. Karl Haschofer, a German general, geographer, and geopolitician, saw Japan as the brother nation of Germany. He traveled the Orient extensively and fell in love with Japan during the 1908 military mission to Tokyo to study the Japanese army and to be an advisor. During his time in the Orient he learned Korean, Japanese, and Mandarin, adding these languages to his repertoire of German, Russian, French, and English. He called the Japanese people the Aryans of the East. When all was lost in Europe for the Axis cause Japan invited Hitler and Mussolini to seek refuge in Japan. They declined. Both of them would choose death fighting for the countries they loved.
Hiro Shioshima was instrumental in forging and signing of the anti Covenant Pact on November 25th of 1936 and the Tripartite Pact on September 27th of 1940. The Allied propagandist William Shire wrote in his pseudo-history book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, that quote, Oshima is more Nazi than the Nazis. Adolf Hitler held Oshima in such high regard that in 1941 he even awarded him the coveted Grand Cross of the Order of the German Eagle and Gold, of which he was one of only 15 ever awarded. Oshima paid Adolf Hitler back with a loyalty and friendship. On a dark day of April 13th, 1945, Oshima met with Ribbentrop and solemnly vowed to stand with Adolf Hitler and the people of Berlin, come what may. He said to Ribbentrop, I do not wish to be treated in the same manner as other diplomats merely by reason of great danger from the ravages of war. This brave old samurai wasn't able to die with his comrades in the hellfire of Berlin. However, Adolf Hitler ordered him and the other diplomats out of Berlin and to safety. On December 16, 1945, he was charged with war crimes and brought before the Kangaroo Court called the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. No surprise, he was found guilty of conspiring to wage aggressive war on November 12, 1948 and sentenced to life imprisonment. This foolishness was later acknowledged and he was paroled in late 1955 and even granted clemency three years later. Here is a German postcard with a message in Japanese characters from 1942, sent from Berlin to Hamburg. It is an interesting artifact of German-Japanese cooperation and friendship. Both countries had civilian, scientific and military exchange programs. The two allies had a deep respect for one another, despite having very different cultures and languages. There were approximately 10,000 Japanese nationals who lived in Germany during the Third Reich. Strange that the liars who rule this world try to convince us otherwise. Adolf Hitler gave a speech on January 30th of 1939, in Berlin, that illustrates very well the alliance between Germany and Japan. The English translation is as follows, quote, The Japanese nation, which in the last two years has set us so many examples of glorious heroism, is undoubtedly fighting in the service of civilization at the other side of the world. Her collapse would not benefit the civilized nations of Europe or of other parts of the world, but would only lead to the certain triumph of Bolshevism in the Far East. Just as there have always been two Germanys, so there have always been two Japans, the one, capitalist and therefore Anglophile, the other, the Japan of the rising sun, the land of the samurai. The Japanese Navy is the expression of this second world. It's amongst the sailors that we found the men nearest to ourselves. End quote. Prophetic, isn't it? We all know communism, with the help of the United States, dual Israeli Zog and British Yiddish Israeli Zog, grips China and much of Asia with an iron fist. The United States is now hopelessly in debt to communist China for trillions of dollars. Let's also not forget that the United States waged two unsuccessful wars against communism in the decades that followed World War II, Korea and Vietnam. The future was, and indeed still is, everything that Adolf Hitler warned us about. Tomoyuki Yamashita was a Japanese military genius amply nicknamed the Tiger of Malaya. He is legendary for tricking the British Yiddish Empire into surrendering Singapore, even though his troops were badly outnumbered, low on ammunition, starving and suffering from malaria. The Japanese, at a cost of 3,000 dead and 30,000 captured, captured 130,000 British, Indian, and Australian troops, the largest surrender of British left Zog Empire personnel in history and the loss of the invincible fortress of Singapore. This fortress was considered to be amongst the most invulnerable in the world. A Times article of the period describes it. For 20 years we constructed this fortress. Two million tons of earth had to be moved and Great Britain spent 60 million pounds, 60 million pounds. Two months ago Singapore was still the mightiest base of Britain and the USA in the hemisphere of the world. This amazing feat helped Yamashita to be executed by the vengeful allies after the war. Talk about cowardice or losers. He was officially charged with war crimes. It was apparent to all that he was innocent of these charges. The reporters covering his show trial even voted 12 to 0 to acquit him. In the end he was guilty of embarrassing the British and murdered for his cleverness. In World War II he was never defeated. He was hung on February 24th of 1946. His last words being, I will pray for the Emperor's long life and his prosperity forever. Tokyo Rose was a generic name given by Allied troops in the South Pacific during World War II to Japanese women who spoke English and broadcasted Japanese propaganda. Although there were more than a dozen women who took part in these morale lowering broadcasts, the woman to whom is most famous for being Tokyo Rose is Ivar Tokari. Ivar was born in Los Angeles, California to parents who had emigrated from Japan. She was visiting relatives in Japan when the war broke out and ended up having to stay there because of it. The broadcasts included popular American music to attract the Allied soldiers to tune in. It is also said that some of the propaganda included reports that were disturbingly accurate about particular units and even about individual servicemen. Ivar was the DJ on a segment of a program called The Zero Hour on Radio Tokyo. She used the name of the man and her talent and sultry voice made Ivar a legend of the Pacific Theater. Allied soldiers soon fell in love with her and couldn't wait to tune into her broadcasts. By late 1943, thousands of GIs were tuning into the Zero Hour to hear the popular music, propaganda skips and her alluring voice. It was an ingenious way to spread their message. After the United States monstrously used a nuclear bomb to holocaust innocent Japanese civilians, even when Japan was on the verge of surrendering, Ivar Togere was arrested. The US military held her for a year and released her because of the lack of evidence against her. Ivar then attempted to return to the US which was when the government was pressured to bring her to trial in 1949. She was arrested once again and charged with treason and was this time imprisoned until 1956. Setsu Kahara was a legendary Japanese actress inside and outside of Japan. She had starring roles in the films Late Spring in 1949 and Tokyo Story in 1953. But even before these famous films she had already appeared in 67 others. All in all she appeared in over 100 films in her career. But the most important to us is her breakout role starring in 1937 for the daughter of the samurai, also called the New Earth, and in German it is known as Die Tok the Day Samurai. 
This film was a German and Japanese co-production, directed by Mansakh Itami and Arnold Fank. It was to strengthen ties between the soon to be wartime allies. Upon her death in September 2015, the reclusive Hara had not been seen in the movie industry for at least four decades. Nejiko Suwa was a famous Japanese violinist who rose to fame as a child prodigy. She is most noted today for having been presented as Stradivarius by propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. In 1936 Suwa moved to Brussels to study, and thereafter to Paris in 1938. She had a European debut in the Sound of Chopin on May 15, 1939. During World War II she continued to stay in Paris furthering her studies. Suwa gave concerts to wounded German troops during this time. In recognition for her services to the troops and her superb technique and a brilliant display of art on the violin, Goebbels presented her with a Stradivarius on February 22, 1943. Suwa was a featured soloist in a brilliant concert given by the Berlin Philharmonic in October 1943. She continued to perform to much acclaim in various German cities thereafter. Hakuan Yasutani was a Soto Roshi, and the founder of the Sanboki Odan Zen Buddhist organization. Soto is a sect of Roshi is an honorific title used for a highly venerated senior teacher in Zen Buddhism. Yasutani first drew breath in the Shishioka Prefecture in Japan. He was born poor and with little prospects for his future. But he proved it is what's inside a man that counts and he would become one of the most highly respected Zen masters ever. There is an interesting account of his birth. His mother had already decided that her next son would be a priest when she was given a bead off rosary by a nun who instructed her to swallow it for a safe childbirth. When he was born his left hand was tightly clasped around that same bead. During his youth he studied Buddhism and was taken under the wing of several teachers, living a strict religious life in various temples. He also became an elementary school teacher and principal. This lasted for ten years, but was obviously not his fate. When he was thirty years old he married and eventually had five children. In 1925, at the age of 40, he returned to his destiny as a Buddhist priest. In the years that followed he became a specially dispatched priest for the propagation of the Soto sect, and traveled from place to place giving lectures. He was very unhappy during this time, describing it as a peak of mental anguish. He also felt that he was deceiving himself and others by untrue teaching and irresponsible sermons. Obviously there were many things about his sect's teachings that he disagreed with. Yasutani was a highly controversial figure in Buddhism, defying customs and speaking out against age-old traditions. By 1954, after certain restrictions were lifted by the American occupation, he founded his own organization as an independent school of Zen. He no longer recognized the authority of his old sect's ecclesiastical leaders. He was tireless in his search for spiritual truth and understanding. In the decades that followed he taught, lectured, wrote and took care of his growing family. His career as a Zen teacher flourished. In 1962 he first traveled to the United States. He lectured in over a dozen cities and was well received. It's interesting to note that an American who had been a soldier in World War II was instrumental in bringing Yasudani to the US. This American had studied Zen while a prisoner of the Japanese in POW camp. During the 60s he made six more visits to America. He made a powerful influence on the embryonic American Zen tradition. In fact he is credited as being the sort of father of American Buddhism. He was very prolific during his life, leaving behind almost 100 volumes of writings and giving thousands of lectures. According to Ikikawa Hakushin, Yasudani was a fanatical militarist and anti-communist. According to Brian Victoria, Yasudani was influenced by national socialism, which he was introduced to from the German Karl Friedrich Graf Durkheim during the 1940s. Durkheim would later become an important figure in Buddhism as well. In 1943, Yasutani wrote Treatise on Practice and Enlightenment, which said, Annihilating the treachery of the United States and Britain and establishing the greater East Asia prosperity sphere is the only way to save the one billion people of Asia so that they can, with peace of mind, proceed on their respective paths. Furthermore, it is only natural that this will contribute to the construction of a new world order, exorcising evil spirits from the world and leading to the realization of eternal peace and happiness for all humanity. I believe this is truly the critically important mission to be accomplished by our great Japanese empire. Kubotajan, the third abbot of the religious foundation San Bokudan is quoted as saying, Yasutani Roshi did foster strongly right-winged and anti-Semitic ideology during as well as after World War II. Yasutani had been strongly criticized for supporting Japanese militarism and the war to free the Asian peoples. But it has been noted that Japanese Buddhists as a whole were staunch supporters of Imperial Japan and its courageous efforts during World War II. In 1943 Yasutani said, We must be aware of the existence of the might teachings of the Jews who assert things like, the existence of equality in the phenomenal world, thereby disturbing public order in our nation's society and destroying governmental control. Not only this, these demonic conspirators hold a deep-rooted delusion and blind belief that, as far as the essential nature of human beings is concerned, there is, by nature, differentiation between superior and inferior. They are caught up in the delusion that they alone have been chosen by God and are, therefore, an exceptionally superior people. The result of all this is a treacherous design to use up, control of, and dominate the entire world, thus provoking the great upheavals of today. It must be said that this is an extreme example of the evil resulting from superstitious belief and deep-rooted delusion.